Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to episode 269 of Psycho's Platters, always powered by coffee each and every time. Um, I think I am going to title this episode Tribute to My Dad, A Royal Affair. Um, and I'll explain why, sort of, in a second here. Um, I'm sorry, but I haven't had a video come out in a couple weeks. The last couple weeks have been kind of um, something else. Um, what I wanted to start the episode off with is that uh, as of uh, Friday morning, uh, July 12th, 2019, my father, Jerry, uh, passed away at age 74 of cancer. I am very grateful that he is not in pain anymore and he's in heaven. I'm also very grateful that I was able to go and see him in May. Something inside me told me to, and I'm glad. Sometimes I like listening to my inner voice or intuition or whatever it is. Most of the time it's good. But uh, I got to see him, and... I had what I would call closure, nice closure. I got to uh, say what I wanted to say, and he got to say what he wanted to say. And uh, <clears throat> because I was, what was it? I was there the weekend of uh, Mother's Day. I said, well, you know what? Since I'm up here, we'll do Father's Day early. So I got him a card, and I got him. He collected clocks. I got him a small clock. He was happy but tearful. I was too. And uh, so, kind of what I want to sort of talk about for a minute or two, if that's all right with you, um, is his musical music, the music he liked. Now he's a little bit more um, mysterious to me, as opposed to Jessica, my wife, my late wife who uh, I knew a lot of her stuff. Uh, my dad, Jerry, um, sort of not so much. He came into my life at eight years old. I was eight years old, not him. <laughs> um, and he took on a job that I don't think most people would have done. Um, he helped to raise a kid that, in essence, wasn't his own. My real dad left when I was two months. And so, you know, he had no instruction manuals to, to raise this uh, slightly obnoxious, precocious eight-year-old. But uh, he did a hell of a job. He did. We had our disagreements. We did. But I also remembered the good times, too. And there was. So music-wise, though, with him, <clears throat> um, I really did not get to know a lot. I know that uh, him uh, being of Irish nature, he loved the Irish songs. He did. Um, I seem to recall, at one point or another, he had the Clancy Brothers. I, I remember hearing about them. Um, he also liked the Irish Rovers. Uh, the Unicorn Song, I remember that bit. Um, Kathy Ember likes that tune, too. Um, but, um, and, and he liked Ricky Lee Jones. I remember he liked the song Chucky's In Love, which I actually kind of liked, too. But it was really funny. He, I remember he had that record. He didn't have too many records. He didn't. He liked music, but most of the time he'd, he'd listen to uh, uh, the car. At least, you know, when I was around in the 70s and 80s. Um, but I have two stories about, about that I want to mention. Actually, uh, the first one, not so much of a story, but the second one is more interesting, I think. He did like Janis Joplin. He really, really did. He said it was, uh, it was, just, it was just her voice was unique. It, uh, it was special. 
that's what he said. He told me that he was special. So I remember buying him um, uh, uh, Janis Joplin's greatest hits a few years back for Christmas, and uh, he really liked he really liked her. And then uh, I got a Beatles story for you. <clears throat> now. Uh, my dad was a naval man. He uh, he was in the navy, and uh, he he went to whatever naval boot camp. Um, I want to say Bethesda Naval Base in uh, in An Annapolis. I don't know if I'm getting this right, but it's supposed to be near Washington D.C. Okay, so. He distinctly remembers because he was either getting out or he was going on leave or something. And he said, Paul, he goes, I remember hearing the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand on the radio, on the transistor or whatever it was. But he kept insisting that it was late 1963 and I'm going you know and I didn't know for quite a while <clears throat> I kinda thought his I didn't want to think that his memories were a little off turns out I was off I did a little research and it turns out that Washington DC did play I wanna hold your hand in the last week of December of 1963 because that was when technically D-45 was rush released and if I remember correctly it was like December 28th or December 29th 1963 it came out and Washington DC uh, whatever radio station it was was one of the first radio stations in the country to play that song so in essence my dad got to hear the Beatles before most people did uh, on the radio and I kinda thought that was a cool ass fact that he got to hear that along with whoever else was listening at that time. So, um, I, I, um, I, I miss him. I do. I, I know, uh, um, being that he's far away, it, It hasn't totally hit me yet. Maybe it's because I knew he was dying, as opposed to Jessica dying suddenly. You know, maybe I—I I don't know. This whole grief, the whole stages of grief and the process of grief, is very interesting yet confusing. So rest in peace. Um, I love you, my dad, Jerry. Okay. And uh, one lesson that you have to walk away with on this is the ones you love, tell them that. Tell them you love them. And just any, any, um, clear the air with anything. Tell them you love them. Clear the air. You'll feel better. And they will too. That's what it's all about. All right. Enough preaching on that bit. So, I said, true to my dad, a royal affair. We're walking into the second piece of the video. Went to a concert unexpectedly. I, uh, I, you know, I told you in my last video that I saw Ozark Mountain Daredevils on the 4th of July. Um, I ended up, there's, there's really only two concerts that I wanted to go to at the AMP this year in, in Rogers, Arkansas. And the Royal Affair Tour was one of them. The Royal Affair Tour uh, what is um, Carl Palmer's ELP Legacy, John Lodge from the Moody Blues, Asia, and Yes. Oh, and uh, with the ELP Legacy, special guest... Arthur Brown from Crazy World of Arthur Brown. You know, the guy that goes, fire! Do, 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 do! Na, 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 na. Yeah, with the flaming hat and everything. So they all were performing. 
I won tickets at the last minute. I, I couldn't afford them, okay? I can't afford a lot of stuff right now uh, due to this, you know, being on this temporary disability shit. So I won four pair of tickets, four pack of tickets. And I'm like, I kept praying somehow that, I would, that they wouldn't be long. Turned out they weren't because I won these from the amp. I got C-section, uh, C-section seats, which, if I remember correctly, were normally sixty dollars a piece. Yeah, sixty bucks a piece. Fifteenth row, we were at, and I invited Dougie Fields, Dougie Fields, Doug Fields. Sorry, uh, host of the Vinyl Grotto, A.K.A. Dougie Fresh, <laughs> uh, to come along with me. We had other people that were supposed to go to the concert, but. They got sick or were busy or something like that. So it was just me and him. So, as I am a vinyl nut, I bring albums. And uh, so did he. And we parked very, very close to the venue. And uh, and uh, we went after the gates were open for once. I, I just figure, okay. And... Uh, got ourselves in within like two minutes no problem now the reason why I brought vinyl because normally I don't bring vinyl into this venue I know I really don't uh, the old amp you would have had a better chance um, pre 2012 I think the amp's been around since 2012 2013 so the old amp you could have had a better chance at trying to meet some of the musicians here it's impossible, unless you do some VIP crap with the band. So, I heard a rumor a few days before this that one of the bands was doing a meet and greet on this tour every stop. And I'm going, but I couldn't figure out who it was, verified. So, I didn't lay all my eggs in one basket. I brought vinyl from each on the tour stop. So we get in there and the first surprise we're by the merch looked at the merch they had a lot of nice merch but next to the merch table was this uh, with this other tent and it had um, artwork Roger Dean artwork and if you are a big fan of Yes Asia um, uh, Ur Uriah Heap, I think, had a little bit. Uh, Gentle Giant, tons of bands, tons. Roger Dean has been an iconic record album co uh, cover artist for over 50 years. This man's work is impressive. Sometimes for me, jaw dropping, honestly. Well, I went off and I'm looking through the stuff, and I gotta confess, the price range, I don't recall seeing anything cheaper than $400. I could have been wrong, but I did not, you know, see anything under 400 bucks. It went from like 400 to six grand, and I think the six grand piece was a very beautiful uh, representative of the album cover for Yes's Tales of Topographic Oceans, which I love. I I love all the Yes covers he's done. Well, I brought some Yes vinyl. So did my buddy, Doug. And I saw there was another table next to the tent. And I never, I didn't know who Roger Dean looked like. But something told me, and I'm like, come on, let's go. Well, this, I'm, I have a feeling about this. And so sure enough, I went, and I went in front of him and I said, are you? And he turns and says, yes, I am. <laughs> so I shook his hand, told, told Mr. Dean how, how much I love his artwork. And to me, honestly, he's the number one album, rock album cover artist of all time, to me anyway. Uh, maybe followed by Frank Frazetta and... Uh, and uh, Ken Kelly, and then there's a handful of other ones, okay? But Roger Dean's work just stands out. And so, he was gracious enough to sign 
he autographed, I don't know if you can see it, Silver Sharpie, the glare might be strange, he signed Classic Yes, he signed actually one of my favorite Yes albums, Drama, Yeah is the only album that does not have John Anderson in the lineup from the from the 70s heyday. And lastly, Asia's first album from 82. Man, oh man, I have, I told Mr. Dean, I said, I bought this album the week it came out, and I was 14. And I stared at this damn thing. I said, this is, this is just such a piece of work, it's such beauty. And he thanked me, of course. But to meet Roger Dean was just very, very cool. So, this is also going to be a concert review, too, okay? So, we get, our, we get to our seats, and I notice it's not full. Now, I've been to a lot of amp shows. The amp can hold about, um, I'm told, 7,500, maybe 8,000 people if you, if you uh, shove them in the lawn. You're not allowed lawn chairs. You shove them all in the lawn like cattle, which I always hated that. I, I, won't, I can't do lawn anymore. I stopped after uh, Steely Dan and Brian Adams. I said, I can't do lawn anymore. It was screwing up my back. So I have to have seats all the time. I, that's just how I am. So even the lawn was over half empty. And I was just sitting here going, and I turned to Doug, I'm like, this just don't seem right. Every concert I've gone to has been an, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> a near sellout. Honestly, Kiss, Ringo, um, Steely Dan was pretty close. I remember it was like three quarters at least for Dan. And I'm just sitting here and I'm going, what the hell's going on? And not many more people showed up. You know, oh, there's always these concert people that don't show up for the opening acts and they just decide to waltz their ass in like an hour into the show because all they give a shit about is the main band. Um, there wasn't that many of them either. So, uh, every what it was, was there, it was like a taster. Uh, ELP Legacy was five songs, uh, John Lodge was seven, Asia was nine tunes, Yes got twelve songs. Um, Carl Palmer's ELP Legacy, Carl still got it, oh my god. I know he's in his 70s, I think he's in his early 70s, and he just played the hell out of those drums. My god, he was insane, he was a madman, he was a madman in those songs. Um, I'm not going to give you the whole set list and stuff, but like Fanfare for a Common Man, Hoedown, he did... It was really, really good. Um, he had some excellent musicians with him, too. I'm sorry I can't pronounce Paul's last name because I, I, it's just very long. And for the life of me, the bass player... I'm sorry, the first name I don't remember, but the last name was Pistorius. I'm going, wait a minute. Is this is this Jaco's kid? Because, I mean, the guy was going way... I'm like, that'd be neat if it was Jaco's kid uh, playing bass for, for Carl Palmer. So, uh, and then Arthur Brown came out. He did he did two songs. Can't remember the one song, but uh, but he did Fire. Of course he did Fire. And, uh, and so he guessed it. It was kind of neat that he was on the two tunes. And, uh, and afterwards, uh, Arthur got up on the microphone after the five song set was over and said, Hey, he goes, after Asia's set, some of us are going to be doing a meet and greet at the merch tables. I'm like, yes. I'm like, and Doug was happy. I was happy. I'm like, good. And they mentioned, that, they mentioned a couple of the musicians. So we go into John Lodge's set. Seven songs. Um... I don't honestly recall him introducing the musicians he had, but they were the, the musicianship in this whole entire show was excellent, without a doubt. Okay, all of the bands, and so Lodge gets there and he plays uh, six Moody Blues songs and I think one song um, from the Blue Jays album, uh, him and him and Justin Hayward's album. Okay, um, I remember Legend of a Mind. I love that song, a.k.a. Timothy Leary. 
Um, but that one, uh, and then he a couple more. He finished off with "I'm Just a Singer in a Rock and Roll Band" and "Ride My Seesaw." That was the last of that. And by the way, change over times were very quick. It was maybe 15 minutes at the most between acts, which I'm like, I wish it was like this all the damn time. Seriously, because most of the time it's 30 minutes or more for people to get sh change out. It's ridiculous. So we get from John Lodge, then Asia comes on the stage, okay? Uh, <clears throat> Asia's lineup technically is this. You've got two original members. You've got Jeff Downs on keys and Carl Palmer on drums. Uh, Billy Sherwood who of course is in Yes, now, um, taking over for the late Chris Squire, plays bass, and on guitar and singing is Ron Bumblefoot Thal. Ron Bumblefoot Thal has done a bunch of solo work. He, he was in Guns N' Roses for eight years. He's on Chinese Democracy. And there's a new band called Sons of Apollo, which, uh, go check that out. I, and I think you'll get a kick on that. But... He was doing this Asia tour, <clears throat> and so like I said, there was nine songs to the set. Uh, they played they, they played the hit. Uh, well, they started out with Go, and then went into Don't Cry. Uh, they went they went and did Video Killed the Radio Star, which I thought was, was interesting and neat. Um, Ron does not go off and attempt to be a John Wetton clone. Nobody can replace John Wetton. But Ron does a very admirable job. I really honestly think so. Um, I got to, you know, I'll tell you what I said to him in a minute, but, um, so what happened, though, on this tour is that Steve Howe comes out for the last four songs. So, for those four songs, um, which there was, uh, Soul Survivor, Only Time Will Tell, In Your Wildest Dreams, and Heat of the Moment being the closer. So, for those four tunes, you've got three quarters of the original Yes, um, not yes, like Asia lineup. Okay, I'm tired. Still working on this first cup. So I was like, awesome, you know, that he's doing this. So then, after after Asia's set was over with, Doug and I went in, you know, and got in line. That line went pretty quick for this meet and greet. They had it snaked and a little bit set up. <clears throat> the first person that I got to meet was Carl Palmer. Carl Palmer was there. I thought, how awesome. I had, and I actually had no Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. Doug had some Emerson, Lake, and Palmer because all my Emerson, Lake, and Palmer albums, Carl previously signed for me by proxy mail along with two Asia covers uh, when Carl did an appearance at a drum store in Chicagoland years ago. So I dug around, and like I said, he was he was very nice guy. The brief amount of time I got to talk to him, and he was the other autograph on my first Asia album, and he put 2019. I thought that was pretty damn awesome. Um, like I said, he signed he signed that for me, and uh, also Arthur Brown, Crazy World of Arthur Brown, was also at the merch table too. So, I went and got this signed for Doug, but Carl Palmer and Arthur Brown signed both of these of, on the first album from 68. This was uh, Carl's pretty much uh, first appearance before he ended up doing Emerson, Lake, and Palmer and all the other fun stuff. Um, if I remember correctly, I think he played it on an Atomic Rooster album, too. I tried to dig for that, but no such luck. Uh, Crazy World of Arthur Brown, he's got a new album out. Go check it out on his website. Uh, Bumblefoot, Ron Thal, he has a new solo album, too, if I remember correctly, and Sons of Apollo have got a new album. Uh, I met Ron, uh, he was interesting, I got to talk to him for a couple minutes. And, uh, of course, I'm, I'm on their Facebook pages, and uh, I actually suggested, I'm like, hey, you think that you think your Asia's going to do a new album with this lineup? And he actually said he's not sure, but he's intrigued. That's what he said to me. 
So who knows? Maybe we will get something in the future. I'd be kind of curious to see how post John Wetton lineup this is going to be. Um, so the last part I want to talk about. Some people are either going to agree with me. Some people are going to get pissed off. Either way, I'm just telling you how I see it. This is an honest assessment. Now, I like Yes. I do. I like the old school Yes. Um, the first time I think that I ever got anything from them... Oh, jeez. It, it was either going for the one or Tormato. That was that was the first Yes album, brand new that I that I got, and uh, I just liked it. I, I dug it. I'm I like prog rock. I don't like all of prog rock though. Okay. Um, I played Gentle Giant's Octopus and it drove me nuts. I I, I just I, I I don't like it. I, I tried to give it another listen. Just too busy. I hate things that are too busy. So. Um, <clears throat> so when Yes started their 12 song set, nine regular and then three, three encore, um, I'm like, okay, okay. Now, the thing that I thought was a little weird was, here's your, here's your lineup, okay? So you got John Davidson. John Davidson's been with them for eight years. All right. So he's been there for eight years. Steve Howe, classic Yes member on guitar. Billy Sherwood, who has been in the Yes world since the 90s, on, bla on bass, of course, taking over for Chris Squire. Jeff Downs on keys. And on drums, it's been double duty type stuff. Jay Shellen, if I remember correctly, Jay Shellen was in Kingdom Come. I think I've got this right. And Alan White. Now, I'm at, I'm at stage. I'm a weird stickler person, okay? I do like musicianship, but for most of the show, Steve Howe was the only classic lineup member there. Alan White result was relegated to two songs. He ended up doing America, and he did they did a cover of a matching in the encore set. The rest of the time, he shuffled off stage. By the time the third song of the 12 song set happened, people started leaving. And I'm not talking about onesies, twos. Bunches started leaving. And I'm going, okay. And I'm like, why? What the hell's going on here? Now, for some of them, they had little kids. I'm assuming, you know, they're going to be bored. They're going to be bored. You know, it could be any reason. But there was a lot of them that uh, just left. And it kept getting that way through the rest of the show. Uh, and I'm not going to lie. By halfway point in the concert, I got bored. I don't think I ever got bored in a concert before. I, I think maybe half of, it, half of it was because some of the material I didn't know. They did play a handful of more newer stuff, you know, non-Anderson tracks. And yes, I like Yes with John Anderson, okay? I, I don't know what went down in the Yes camp t as to why Anderson... I know Anderson obviously got sick. They wanted to keep going. They booted his ass out. That's the story I remember. But they got together briefly for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction with him. And Steve Howe guested on John's new solo album. So I'm not sure what's going 